what are what's the most urgent thing that needs to be done to address the the most urgent thing is that people need to understand whether they're in in the Philippines whether they're in Russia whether they're in Iran whether they're in China that they are not fighting their own governments alone, that there is a network of autocracies who work together, whether they work together through collaborating financially, the corrupt state-owned companies in one country work with the corrupt state-owned companies in another, um, whether their governments are buying surveillance technology from China or bots from Russia, um, whether it's by investment or whether it's by common propaganda techniques. You know, this is one system and understanding that you're, you know, there's a reason why it's so much more difficult to win than it used to be is extremely important. And so therefore understanding how how democratic activists can collaborate across borders is, is extremely important as well. Is this different from any other time? I mean, there was like leading up to World War II, there were all of these things. I mean, you wrote about Stalin and the Ukraine. I mean, what makes this time more dangerous? I think it's there's a it's it's broader, it's more global, um, and it's also important that the modern dictatorships are not linked by ideology. They don't. You know, the theocrats in Iran and the communists in China and the nationalists in Russia don't have the same set of ideas, but they have they all the same enemies. And the enemies are us, you know, us in the democratic world, meaning not only the democratic countries, but democracy activists in other places. And they see the language of the democratic movement and the language of democracy itself as the most dangerous thing that they need to defeat. And they simply have more tools than dictators of the past. So they have um, the, the tools that Maria Ressa, you've, you've written so so beautifully about to control the internet and to control conversation. Um, they have, you know, the Soviet Union was ultimately a very poor country and its, its leaders weren't personally wealthy. But the leaders of most modern autocracies are personally wealthy and they can use their own personal money to protect themselves. And, and also to invest with and help other dictators. So, so that's a there's a there's a there's a different level of coordination possible and a different scale of power. A tipping point like the Philippines, which China, Russia, like under the time of Duterte, they came in in a way they hadn't really before. I mean, how do you see the Philippines fitting into what you outlined? Globally? Well, it's it's not an accident. I mean, the you know the Chinese look for corrupt autocrats with whom they can work. I mean, they. They, they, they aren't as, they have a little bit different ideology or a little bit different tactics from the Russians, but they prefer dictatorships because then they can pay bribes more easily. Um, and the Russians as well. You know, they don't want to work in liberal democracies where there are checks and balances and where people care about whether the contract was really signed or not, you know, and, and, and where people are watching the money flows and they're not supposed to be bribes and so on. So they'd rather work in, in corrupt autocracies. And so the Philippines becoming a corrupt autocracy means that it becomes more attractive as a space for Russia and China to invest in and to try and run influence campaigns in. You, talk, you were optimistic at the end, right, that the activists here have to begin working together. Well, I think I, I feel kind of morally obligated to be optimistic because, you know, <laughs> what else can we do? <laughs> I mean, well, pe pessimism is one of the tools of autocracy. So what do autocrats do? They teach people to be apathetic. You know, you can't change anything. Nothing can be done. You know, accept the world the way it is. You know, be apolitical. Go home and, you know, you know, play music or write books or paint paintings or do your job and stay out of politics. That's what they teach people. And so I think it's important and incumbent on us and, and, and people who care about the future of their countries to be active in public life and so and so I'm just trying to think of what are the things that we can do to be creative and to be active and I think one of the things we can do is to begin to create these international links right? for example around kleptocracy you know, can't we can't we lobby together for better financial rules um, can't we work together to expose cross-border links and, and corruption you, you, you mentioned um, like things that others can do. Like, can you can you give more specifics, like for journalists, for for businessmen, and other sectors? So you know, biz businessmen have an interest in working together with journalists, with democracy activists, with with transparency activists to expose how corrupt systems work. Because you know, that's a it's like a tax on business. You know, it's, you know, when you have a badly run country. 
where people have to spend a large percentage of their money and time paying bribes and doing you know corrupt deals, then it's harder to get things done. Um, and so they would have an interest in working with the democracy movements to make things better. Um, you can look at other areas as well. I mean, you can you know, rule of law, enforcing rule of law. This is something that matters not just for civil society, but also for business, for lawyers, for civil servants. You know, it's easier to do business in a world where you don't have to, where where you know what the rules are and where you can trust the courts and where the judges aren't, you know, run by the, aren't, aren't, aren't dictated to by the leader and where you can, you have some chance of justice. I mean, living in a system where there's justice and where justice has, you have a chance of getting a fair trial is good for everybody. I mean, it's not a, it's not a, some narrow sphere of society that cares about it, whereas nobody else does. Everybody wants that. Um, and so beginning to build the coalitions inside countries and across countries that can, that can achieve that is, is worthwhile. Impunity online, impunity offline. I mean, it just seems like rule of law is really faltered. Yeah, no, impunity. So, the, so one of the things that the the modern autocrats have learned is to is ways of making themselves immune from criticism, and whether it's through the manipulation of online conversations or whether it's through undermining UN and other international tunes, which the Chinese spend an inordinate amount of time doing and thinking about. Um, you know, or, or undermining the human rights movement, or undermining the language of human rights, or even of UN declaration and documents. This is something they do in order to protect themselves. Um, you know, the, the, the Russia's war in Ukraine is partly about that. So it's, of course, it's a war of conquest and it's a war of imperialism, and um, but it's also a war that's designed to say we don't care about your laws on war. We don't care about the UN Convention on Genocide. We don't care about human rights, and we're going to show you that we don't care. Um, and that's part of what the purpose of the war is. Um, and that's why all autocrats around the world are watching it so closely. Awesome.